Why hello there, and welcome back to Let's Make Us a Character. And in this episode, I will be completing my exciting journey through the old world of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, a series with a very interesting timeline. Having a first edition that remains supported for almost 20 years, with the second and third each struggling to hold on more than four. And I do have to wonder if Games Workshop just doesn't really care about Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I mean, the money in the Warhammer brand is clearly someplace else. But it is still a little weird that Games Workshop only actually published the first edition from 86 to 92, before licensing it out to Hogshead Publishing in 95. And then they only published 2nd edition from 2005 to 2008, before shuttering their entire tabletop role-playing division and then just licensing it out to Fantasy Flight Games, who actually did publish the final few 2nd edition books before making their war crime shaped like a board game. And then after the licensing deal with Fantasy Flight Games expired in 2017, they licensed it out again to Cubicle 7 for the 4th and current edition a company that you may know from the current Doctor Who role-playing game, and uh, a bunch of other stuff, actually. I do like to make the joke that the publisher only has one or no noteworthy titles, but in this case, it is a company that has a history of producing quality tabletop gaming products. And an interesting note about this edition is that Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition, published in 2018, is now the second longest running edition of the game. Unless we want to count first edition as two separate runs, but let's just let fourth edition have this. Also, this edition does pretty much go back to the rules from first and second edition, more or less ignoring all the changes in third, definitely because they were horrible, but also probably because Games Workshop does not own the rights to that version, and therefore would not be able to license any of that content to Cubicle 7. And given all that, I think it would not be too presumptuous here to actually go into this one with a bit of cautious optimism. I mean, it can't be worse than 3rd edition, right? So let's make us a Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th edition character. So, as has been the theme so far, the first thing we need to do is select our character's species. Yes, it is species now, a change that I am sure nobody threw a tantrum about on the internet. And our options are Human, Dwarf, Halfling, High Elf, and Wood Elf. So, compared to the previous edition, Halflings have returned, but we still get two kinds of Elf. And this is where things actually start to get a little interesting. We roll for our species on the table and get Halfling. Then we can either accept that result and get 20 experience points, or simply choose whatever species we want and not get 20 experience points. So let's just stick with Halfling and get ourselves 20 bonus experience points. Next up is Career, and the Career classes have returned from 1st Edition, although they function a bit differently. So just like 2nd Edition, we do not choose a class, and instead there's just one big table to roll on, separated by species. So for our character, we only really need the Halfling columns. And once again, we have a few options on how to proceed. We roll on the table, and then if we accept that result, get 50 experience points. Or, we can choose to roll two more times, then select between all three of the results, and get 25 experience points. Or, we can just choose whatever career we want, and get no bonus experience points. So let's roll, and... Rat Catcher. You know what? I keep joking about the fact that Rat Catcher is an available career in this game, so... You know, let's do it. Let's make us a rat catcher. Because while I do joke about rat catcher, grave robber, and servant being careers available to a character, and some careers are better or worse than others, none of them are, like, completely useless. 
So next we generate our attributes, and we now have 10 characteristics. Weapon skill, ballistic skill, strength, toughness, initiative, agility, dexterity, intelligence, willpower, and fellowship. So basically the 8 from 2nd edition with the return of initiative and agility. So we roll 2d10 for each and add a bonus determined by our species from the attribute table. And for a halfling, those bonuses are plus 10 to weapon skill and strength, plus 20 to toughness, initiative, agility, and intelligence, and plus 30 to ballistic skill, dexterity, willpower, and fellowship. And like everything else, we have some options here. We can either accept the rolls and get 50 experience points, or we can switch the values around and get 25 experience points. Or we can re-roll all of our characteristics and swap the values around, or just allocate 100 points with no experience point bonus. And we got a couple good rolls here, so let's just stick with it and get another 50 experience points. And these experience rewards are an addition that I really like, because it retains the random character generation while also providing the non or less random options and having those both be part of the standard rules. It's not which options do we as a group want to use, instead each player gets to decide if they want to accept the results for a reward or choose a different option. It is a very neat way to handle that. Next we have wounds, which for a halfling is equal to two times our toughness bonus plus our willpower bonus. And basically, every characteristic now has a bonus, which is just equal to the tens place of the value of that characteristic. So it's like strength and toughness bonuses from 2nd edition, but now it's a general thing instead of two specific ones. So with a toughness of 30, we have a toughness bonus of 3, and willpower bonus of 4, so we have 10 wounds total. Then we have Fate and Resilience, which are static values set by our species, and notably all non-humans start with zero fate, but then as a halfling we also get two resilience and three extra points to add to either fate or resilience. And let's just add all of those to fate for reasons. A big one of those reasons being that Fate can still be spent to not die in situations where you otherwise would die. A situation that is not exactly uncommon in this game. Then we have Fortune and Resolve, which are just equal to Fate and Resilience. And then we are asked to choose our character's motivation, which affects how they regain spent resolve. And is something that seems like maybe it should have been done later, but the rules say to do it now, so let's say... Ego. This character is a three foot something rat catcher, so maybe they are motivated by a desire to seem more important than their size and position would suggest. And then finally, well from this table at least, our movement, which is another static value and is three. Then we get five advances for our characteristics, and advances have been changed significantly from the previous editions, and I'm just gonna cover the entire changes to the careers here. So let's pull up the 4th edition Ratcatcher, and just so we have something to compare it to, the 2nd edition Ratcatcher. And the first thing you may notice is that each career now has a career path, which is just four different levels of that career. As indicated with the cross, crossed axes, skull, and shield symbols at each level. And then the advanced scheme is similarly marked with those symbols, as well as also being color-coded in brass, silver, and gold for levels 2, 3, and 4, indicating at which level of the career you gain access to those advances. And right now, you might be thinking, okay, well, there must be some reason why they are using symbols and colors in place of just, you know, numbers that anyone would immediately understand without having to have it explained to them. And well, maybe one of the designers was letting their 12 year old cousin help and that was their contribution. That would be a reason, but to answer the obvious question, no, there is no good or valid reason. There is no situation in which this is more convenient or even not less convenient. 
and the rest of the book just refers to the career levels by number. Except for when they have to explain that for no particular reason, they chose to define them with symbols and colors. Which uh, is what we in the industry like to refer to as fucking stupid. And uh, yeah, sorry for getting a bit saucy there, but it's just such an inexplicably dumb decision in an otherwise competently designed game. And you know, just to make things a bit more convenient, how about I just go ahead and make it not stupid so that we can continue. So like the careers in previous editions, each level has a series of skills, talents, and trappings. However, there are no longer any career entries or exits. And those are all things that I will elaborate on when appropriate. But I believe I was talking about advances and therefore the advance scheme. In 2nd edition, the advance scheme contained a number of 5% increases, 10% in 1st edition, or plus 1 increases, depending on the specific thing that was being advanced. And advances were limited, not just by the career, but for your entire character. And you can watch the 1st or 2nd edition videos for more information on that whole situation, but in short, being a rat catcher allowed you to take two plus five advances in ballistic skill, agility, and willpower, one plus five advance in weapon skill and toughness, and two plus one advances in wounds. And those ten specific advances were the only ones you could take until you changed careers. But in 4th edition, there are no limits on how many advances you can take, only the level at which you have access to them. Which might sound like a pretty cool change when compared to 1st and 2nd edition, but also advances are now purchased in 1% increments. So our 5 free advances translates to 5 points to spend on our weapon skill, ballistic skill, and willpower. So let's head on over to the character sheet, and I guess let's just dump all of those advances into weapon skill, because that is a thing that is going to be important pretty much immediately. So we note down the plus 5 advances and then add the advances to our initial characteristic for our total characteristic. And yeah, there is a reason why we need to keep them separate. But now on to skills and talents. Each species has a selection of skills and talents, and we get to add 5 advances to 3 of our species skills and 3 to another 3. And just like characteristics, there is a base value, which is one of the characteristics, to which we add the advances to get our skill total. So let's put 5 points in Dodge, Perception, and Stealth Underground, and then 3 in Charm, Gamble, and Sleight of Hand. And notably here, Sleight of Hand is an advanced skill, which is why it is not on the basic skill list, but also means that anyone without training cannot even attempt to use that skill. Then we get all of the listed talents, which for a halfling are Acute Senses Taste, Night Vision, Resistance Chaos, Small, and two random talents from the Random Talents table, so Ambidextrous and Strong Legs. Then we get 40 advances to spend on our career skills, and right now we only have access to the 8 level 1 Rat Hunter skills, so let's put 10 advances in Melee Basic and Ranged Sling, then 5 in Athletics, Endurance, Stealth Underground, and Animal Training Dog. And then just for convenience sake, I'm gonna highlight all the career skills here, because we are not even close to done talking about them. For now though, we also get a set of trappings from our class, a cloak, clothing, dagger, hat, pouch, and sling bag containing lunch, and then another set of trappings from our career, which is a sling with ammunition, sack, and small but vicious dog. I know that some of you were a little disappointed that I did not go with Ratcatcher in the second edition video, specifically because of a fondness for the small but vicious dog. Then we get our starting wealth, which is based on our character's status, which is another thing I now have to explain. So we look up our status, which is listed by our career level, and as a level 1 rat catcher, or rat hunter, our status tier is brass, and our status level is 3. Yes, 
In addition to unnecessarily color coding the career levels as brass, silver, and gold, they didn't color code the status tiers, which are also brass, silver, and gold. I did say it was an inexplicably dumb decision. Anyway, at the brass tier, we start with 2d10 brass pennies per status level, so 6d10 and 35. And I'm not going to get too much into the status levels here, but depending on whether or not you have a higher or lower status level than someone else, it can give you either a bonus or penalty to certain skills when interacting with people. Then all of the miscellaneous details, for which there are conveniently a number of tables, but not one for halfling names, so we gotta come up with one of those. And we want something that's, you know, down to earth, but still distinguished and respectable. Mm, how about Tub Thumple Brandy Snatch? That's a, that's a good halfling name. However, there is still one more meaningful aspect we need to define for our character. Their ambitions. We must choose a short-term and long-term ambition for our character, and basically, if we achieve our short-term ambition, we get 50 experience points, and then choose a new short-term ambition. And if we achieve our long-term ambition, we can either get 500 experience points and choose a new long-term ambition, or retire our character and start a new one with half the total XP of the retired character. And the book seems pretty confident that that is a good thing because it allows you to, quote, build a network across the old world. And maybe I'm missing something here, but I don't know, downgrading to a lower level character doesn't seem like that great of a reward, especially in a game known for its lethality. Anyway, let's just say that our short-term ambition is to win the annual rat catching competition, a thing that I'm sure probably exists. And our long-term goal is to become the top exterminator in the city with a whole team of people to do all the actual rat catchery for us while we just sit back and count our coins. And obviously you can change these later as presumably your character's ambitions will shift based on their experiences. And there is also a party short-term and long-term ambition, which functions the same way, except that it's for the entire party. And this character would be done, except that we still have those 120 experience points. And uh, this is actually kind of where it stops being fun. As mentioned earlier, advances no longer have limits. Instead, they just cost more experience points the more advances you have. And we can spend our bonus experience points on the characteristic skills and talents from our career. So, for example, the characteristics available to our career are weapon skill, ballistic skill, and willpower. And we can increase ballistic skill or willpower for 25 experience points per plus one advance, because we currently have no advances in either of those characteristics. But since we already have five advances in weapon skill, each plus one advance is now going to cost us 30 XP. So let's go ahead and put three advances into ballistic skill for 75 XP, bringing our total up to 50 and our sling skill up to 60. Then let's put one in Willpower for another 25 XP, bringing our Willpower, Charm Animal, and Cool Values to 41. And then with our last 20 XP, let's buy two advances in Consume Alcohol. Probably an important skill for halflings. Also, we could have purchased one of the talents available to our career for 100 experience points, but I didn't do that. And with our 120 experience points spent, now this character is done. The core mechanics have more or less stayed the same from 1st and 2nd edition, so we have two basic types of test, simple and dramatic. A simple test is just roll the percentiles versus the target value, so for example, let's say our character is clearing some rats out of a sewer, they are a rat catcher, that is a thing they might be doing, and we need to know if they are able to hear the giant rat coming up behind them in the darkness. That would be a simple test of perception, which is based on initiative. So our initiative is 25, and we have 5 advances in perception, so the total target for the test is 30. 
Then we roll the dice and succeed on a result equal to or less than the target. Dramatic tests are carried out the same, there's just a bit more interpretation afterwards, and I might as well also use this opportunity to explain how you earn money. So basically, you can spend a week working at your career to earn money. Each career has one specified skill that is used for earning, and in the case of a rat catcher, it is melee basic. You know, for killing the rats. So we need to make an average melee basic test. Our melee basic skill is 37, and an average difficulty test has a plus 20 modifier, bringing the target up to 57. So we roll the dice and get a 29, which is a success, but then we need to determine the success level, which is done by subtracting the tens value of the roll from the tens value of the target. And 5 minus 2 is 3. And then that determines how successy the success is. Although the success level doesn't actually matter for this particular test, unless it's negative 6 or lower, I just wanted to explain two things at once. And also, you might notice that this means bumping up the tens place becomes incredibly valuable, because raising a skill from 37 to 39 increases your success chance by 2%, but raising it from 39 to 40 increases all success levels with that skill by 1%. And since we succeeded at the test, we earn an amount of money based on our status tier, which for brass is 2d10 brass pennies. This character is just rolling in pennies. Combat has also had a few changes, so let's say that we have encountered an unfriendly goblin. Because I've just been using goblins as the example enemy in all of these videos, so I want to be consistent. And let's say that we want to attack said goblin with our sling, that unsurprisingly uses our ranged sling skill, which is 60. And since the goblin is medium and we are small, we get a plus 10 bonus to that for a total of 70. So we roll and 34, which is a success with a success level of 7 minus 3 equals 4. And since the attack hit, we also need to determine hit location. However, we do not roll for hit location anymore. Instead, we just reverse the attack roll. So 34 becomes 43, a hit to the right arm. And our sling deals damage equal to the success level plus 6, so 10 overall, which is then reduced by the goblin's armor of 1 and toughness bonus of 3 for 6 damage total. And because we succeeded on the attack, we also get plus 1 advantage a thing I will be explaining shortly. So now, presumably, the goblin, not caring for being slung at, decides to retaliate against us. Melee attacks function a little bit differently than ranged, and are resolved as opposed tests. By default, this is melee versus melee. And our melee basic skill is 37, to which we add plus 10 for each advantage we have, so 47 overall. However, we also take a minus 2 success level penalty when using melee to defend against a larger opponent, which is effectively a minus 20, putting us at an effective 27. Fortunately, we can use dodge instead of melee, which is 38, and presumably advantage still applies to, so 48 versus the goblin's 32. Then attacker and defender both roll, and the one with the highest success level wins the opposed test, which in this case is our character, who avoided the attack and therefore gains another plus one advantage. Basically, whoever wins the opposed test gets the advantage, regardless of if they are the attacker or defender. So if we were to then counterattack on our next turn, it would be with a plus 30 bonus plus 10 for our size, and plus 20 for two advantages. And then as long as we kept succeeding on the combat test, we keep getting advantages, but then lose all of them as soon as we fail or take damage. And then also lose one if you fail to gain any advantage in a round or end the round outnumbered, and it's just, it's a whole thing. And of all the updates to this edition, advantage is probably the most interesting. It's one of those things that sounds like a really cool idea in theory. 
providing a kind of combat momentum to help you hack through waves of enemies. But also a thing that I'm not sure how it would actually work out during gameplay. Like, getting a bonus for every consecutive success on an attack or defense roll, which then applies to attack and defense rolls, making you more likely to get more consecutive successes and more bonuses and so on and so on, is one of those things that sounds really cool when it's happening to you. But also really bad when it's happening to the random snotling that got a few lucky rolls and is now suddenly an unstoppable killing machine. It also gives something of a large advantage to ranged weapons because any time you engage someone in melee combat, you are giving them an opportunity to earn an advantage while losing all of yours. Whereas a ranged attack still gains advantage on a success, but doesn't lose anything on a miss, and the target has no opportunity to win an advantage themselves but will also still lose all of their advantage if they take damage from the attack, which automatically hits on a successful roll. And yeah, hypothetically, the melee fighter does have significantly more opportunities to earn advantage since they can be earned on every attack or defense, but that also means an equally significant number of opportunities to lose advantage and hand it to the enemy. And overall, it's just one of those things where it's got so many moving parts that I feel like you would really have to play with it for a while in order to get a good feeling for if it was overall a beneficial or detrimental addition to the system. The critical hits have also been changed a bit from 2nd edition. You still take a critical wound anytime you take more damage than you have wounds, but now, instead of rolling on a table based on amount of damage taken above current number of wounds, and then looking up that result on a second table listing specific wounds based on hit location, you just roll on that second table of critical wounds by location. And there have been a few other notable changes. The chance of instant death from a critical is now 1% for every critical wound, versus 2nd edition where depending on the level of the critical wound, it could be as low as 0% or as high as 90. But your chances of eventual death may actually be higher. It's one of those things where it's very difficult to compare the two. So let's just go over how our character could die. Let's say that at some point in a battle, we have two wounds remaining and take three damage. That would knock us down to zero wounds, there are no negative hit points, and we would incur a critical wound. Each critical wound has a value from one to five, which determines how many critical wounds you take. And let's just say we suffered a severed finger, which gives us four critical wounds plus the bleeding condition but being reduced to zero wounds also gives us the prone condition until we are healed to at least one wound. However, if we are not healed within a number of rounds equal to our toughness bonus, we also gain the unconscious condition. And whenever you gain the unconscious condition while at zero wounds, you compare your total number of critical wounds to your toughness bonus, and we have four critical wounds and a toughness bonus of three. And since we have more critical wounds than toughness bonus, we are dead. Although, of course, we could spend a fate point to, you know, not be dead. Also, you now score a critical hit or fumble, depending on success or failure, whenever the result of your roll is doubles. So 11, 22, 33, 44, etc. And this is a pretty interesting crit slash fumble system, because in addition to using a property unique to the percentile dice, it scales with the level of your skill. Although this is another thing that makes certain skill levels significantly more valuable. If you have a skill of 43 and you roll a 44, that's a fumble. Put one more advance in that skill and a 44 becomes a critical. Every 11 points shifts 1% from your fumble chance to your critical chance. And that is basically it for mechanics, and character advancement has also been updated, so that is another thing I need to talk about. As previously mentioned, career exits are no longer a thing, but each career now has four levels. 
So when it comes time to change careers, we can move into the next level of our current career or the first level of any other career in our class for 100 experience points, provided that the career is completed. Which, given that advances are no longer limited, means something kinda different now. Basically, to complete a career, you need to have 5 advances per level, so 5 at 1, 10 at 2, 15 at 3, 20 at 4, in all of that level's characteristics, 8 of the available skills, and have 1 of the available talents. And looking at what we have right now, we have the required advances in one characteristic and six skills, as well as the required one talent. It does not matter where we got any of them, only that we have them. So, like the previous editions, what you gain in one career will likely help you move through future careers more quickly. But now let's move into the future where we've met all of those minimum requirements and also just happen to have an extra 100 XP, which we will then spend to move up to the second level of Rat Catcher. So our status increases from Bronze 3 to Silver 1. We add toughness to our career characteristics, as well as all of the new career skills, and notably, with 10 advances, our Melee Basic Stealth Underground and Range Sling skills already meet the minimum requirements to complete level 2. So we only need to complete 5 more. At any level, you only need 8 skills to meet the required advances, regardless of how many career skills you currently have. However, we will need to have 10 advances in all 4 of our characteristics, as well as one of the level 2 talents. And speaking of the talents, while we do gain new level 2 talents, we also lose access to the level 1 talents. So if we wanted any of those, we should have taken them before advancing. Although if we want to, when changing careers, we can move down to any of the lower levels in addition to up to the next level or sideways into the first level of a different career from our class. Or if we really wanted to, we could also just move into the first level of a career from any class for 200 XP. And also, we can switch without completing our current career, but that also costs an additional 100 XP. So, hypothetically, for 300 experience points, you can switch to the first level of any career at any time. Which, considering the skyrocketing cost of advances, isn't always going to be a bad idea. Like, when you get to level 4 and need to get 6 characteristics to 20 advances at the cost of 50 XP each, an extra 100 XP to advance without completing the career might be preferable to the 1500 you need to raise the 6 characteristics from 15 to 20, in addition to the 1200 for the 8 skills. And that was a Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, 4th edition character. You may recall from my video on the 2nd edition that my general takeaway there was that it just kinda felt like 1st edition dressed up like a D&D 3rd edition book. Because here's a thing that people really like to pretend isn't true, game design trends change for a reason, and tend to stagnate for no reason other than fear of change. But 4th edition actually feels like there was a legitimate attempt to modernize the game while still retaining the elements that were core to the game's identity. Like one of the many, many things I strongly criticized about 3rd edition was the changes made to the attributes, because strength, constitution, dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma are Dungeons & Dragons stats. If I show you those six stats without context, even renamed, you will think Dungeons & Dragons because that is part of that brand. In contrast, having weapon skill and range skill as core attributes are things that feel very much like they are core to the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay product identity. Because here's another thing that people probably aren't going to like, the Warhammer brand is only a selling point, or meaningful at all, to someone who is familiar with the Warhammer brand. So Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay really needs to have its own identity as a game 
independent of its identity as a Warhammer product, in order to be a thing that you would choose over a competing fantasy role-playing game, for reasons other than just really liking squigs. And that is something that I think this version of the game actually does pretty well. It retains a lot of what made that 1986 game an appealing and distinctive alternative at the time, without still feeling like it's a game from 1986. Like, a thing I didn't draw much attention to earlier in the video because it's such a small change to the rules is actually one of the biggest changes overall to the game, and that is that there has been a significant lowering of the difficulty. If you watch my videos on 1st and 2nd edition, you will know that my biggest criticism of those two editions was the fact that your average success chance was below 40%. And the average success chance has been significantly raised in this edition, which I already explained in the video and you might have forgotten about because it was done by something as simple as changing an unmodified role from average to challenging, and then having an average test be made with a plus 20 bonus which is kind of a stupidly simple way to adjust the entire average of a character's ability level without actually adjusting the characters that much. An average characteristic is still 31, but now that 31 gives you a 51% chance of succeeding on an average task. Also, the way skills are handled helps quite a bit with this because now training and skills gives you an actual bonus by default instead of just having your success chance go from horrible to bad. But this does also lead me into my biggest actual rules criticism of this game. I feel like it would not be a controversial statement to say that one of the worst elements of a lot of percentile roll under systems is allocating points in 1% increments, which is why a lot don't do that. For example, the first two editions of this game. And while that is just kind of annoying on its own, when you combine that with an increasing cost per plus 1% advance at every five advances, it just feels really annoying. One of the things I really liked about the first two editions was that character advancement felt simple and convenient, and this does not give that same feeling. But aside from that minor critique, I think that overall the updates here are really good and a lot of them are fairly clever. Things like the advantage system and the crits and fumbles by rolling a double. Game elements that make the game system fun to engage with. And that is all I have to say on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, 4th edition. A pretty good modernization of a classic game that manages to drag it into the 21st century while still holding on to a lot of the things that made the original game distinctive. And now that I am done with Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, join me next time when I'll be looking at something else. And thank you for watching, with extra special thanks to my Fight and Flail Snails, Randy Maholland, and Toshi Rokuro. If you'd like to be cool like them, check out my Patreon, where you can get early access to videos and fun stuff that I make for the Patreon. But if you don't want to do that, that's cool too. You can still hit all the lovely buttons, like, subscribe, these other videos floating around screen that either myself or the cold, heartless YouTube algorithm have lovingly selected for you, which I'm sure are lovely videos that you will also enjoy. And I will see you next time.